Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to be doing some special selections today, and that is where one of you guys tells me exactly what you want me to check out, and I do it. Today's selection comes at us from Justin Hamilton Salem, suggests Slint, Good Morning Captain. Note, they were only 18 to 20 when they wrote this song in 1990. They broke up before it came out. Pitchford, or sorry, Pitchfork, The Guardian, and others have hailed it as one of the greatest albums of the era, and this song is the pinnacle of that album. You have my attention. <laughs> I don't think I've heard of Slimp before. Uh, it's kind of wild that a band so highly regarded completely flown under my radar even just by name there's a lot of bands that i might not have heard their music but i know of them they're popular enough um, and praised highly enough that at least their names have made it to my ear holes and slint is a name i've just never heard so i'm really interested in uh, checking this out so we got good morning captain here let's dive into this A lot of dissonance there. I like that the delayed uh, chord change. It was changing on the end of one rather than a downbeat of one. Drum, bass, spoken word. Yeah. Once again, we have the and of one for the note transition. that creeping tension, heavy emphasis on dissonance, this whole song. And it's not even being out of key. I'm I'm fairly certain it's a tonality thing. laying down the snare on two and four this entire time so far. There was a sound at the window then. The captain started. His breath was still. Slowly. He turned. Know that lower end intonation I can slowly just kind of ignore, push it into the background.
song is quite relentless though, never letting the listener get away from this tension, uh, almost like a, a fear, drowning in fear, being all consumed by... Of course, as soon as I say it's relentless, we get a nice quiet moment right here that's slightly more consonant. That muted bell sound is giving an interesting, really sharp, hollow texture to a lot of the more open-ended sort of reverberation we're getting throughout everything else. Very sharp contrast as far as tone goes. Behind the edge of the window, so. Very cold. Everything else has been sort of boring. That was a very cold sound, though. His face was flushed and timid. He stared at the captain through frightened eyes. The captain reached for something to hold. The drummer was just a hair behind on uh, that B3 there. I'm glad they left that in. I love that. is though very overwhelming and all encompassing. and of two and then the downbeat of four and the and of four those are our three accent points very interesting all right first of all who was this justin Justin, Justin, Justin. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all know how much I dislike dissidents. Um, but y'all keep pushing me right into it. We, we've done two 20th century composers who work with dissidents in just the past month, month and a half, maybe. Uh, and now we have this... Uh, I don't know, is this post-rock? It definitely feels like post-rock to me, but not uh, not in... Actually, it does kind of share some ideas with post-rock. I was going to say, though, it's not as texturally as similar, but it does feel like an evolution of rock, what rock uh, you know, pushed to its limits. And that's kind of how I view most post-genres, is taking the trappings and experimenting and pushing them through to something. And eventually, one idea is going to stick, and it's going to get the post-genre label. Post-rock is very much its own thing, and this is sort of post-rock adjacent, I would say. 
but more generally speaking, just post being what happens when an idea evolves past its its current point. Uh, you know, I, I could see this being one of the a, a branch that post rock could have become. God, that dissonance, though, man. Nails on a chalkboard for for seven minutes. I'd, I don't want to say that and sound mean. I really don't. Uh, there's there's a lot of really cool things going on in the song. We're going to dive into them and stuff like that. But just as a casual listener for an entire song to be predicated upon dissonance and not so much chordal dissonance, but tonality dissonance. We're talking about, you know, microtones clashing and really getting the most effective form of that dissonant warble. The, the 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 harshness of the dissonance, uh, and then running that through overdrive and distortion, which is going to amplify the effects even more. Yeah, the the casual part of me did not enjoy the textures of this song, but uh, that's all in jest, as usual. I'm not upset. It was selected, Justin. I, I hold nothing against you <laughs> for selecting this. Um, but let's dig into some cool things here. And keeping in mind it was from the 90s and we had a bunch of uh, you know late teenagers, 18 through 20, working on this. So, here's what the song does ridiculously well. It creates an atmosphere of tension, uh, dread, fear, uh, maybe even a bit of horror in some sense and dives into it, moving constantly between layers of such emotions. And another way of saying it moves between varying uh, intensities of these emotions. And it mostly all predicates on the feeling of the tones, the timbres, uh, what kind of emotions they push off, but also the overemphasis on the dissonance. The dissonance is key here, and as usual, well, not as usual, but this is going to be one of those songs that I do not enjoy as a casual listener, but greatly appreciate from an artistic point of view because of what it does on a artistic level by merging themes in the lyrics with themes in the music. I'm pretty sure that's where that's where this analysis is going to conclude. Um, so the song really pivots between two ideas. We have the sparse, quiet distortion. No, not distortion. Dissonance. Uh, in the guitar and maybe a bass there's there's maybe it's just a bass maybe it's a bass and a guitar with the very subtle drums and the spoken word and then we pivot off to a more explosive section that moves through three ideas uh, ending with a larger distorted overdriven guitar and really hammering home in the dissonance in that as well as some more energetic and explosive drums. The only time that we do not move between these two ideas is in the finale where we get the yelling on top of something that sort of fits in the middle of those ideas. And it feels to me like a constant back and forth between severity of fear or of terror, or of tension, or of anything that is in that realm of terror. And it's sort of like we have these interludes of pockets where the fear is still present, just not as palpable. And maybe there's a little bit more, um, I don't want to say optimism, but maybe self-awareness of the situation. Uh, you know, you've calmed yourself down. You know that you're still in a situation you're not enjoying. 
but you're trying to talk yourself through or rationalize it or you know help yourself calm down so you can think properly to get out of the situation and then those moments are met with the larger more explosive sections where the fear is not just palpable but present and that is where the anxiety starts to set in and the feelings of dread and it really pivots between these two concepts now I mentioned a couple of times that the song is overwhelming, and I mean that in every sense of the word. It feels like I'm being suffocated or drowned with this tension, with this unease, with all of this stuff. I'm not really enjoying these emotions I don't like feeling too often, if ever. I don't know if I've ever liked feeling dread or fear. <laughs> It's a weird thing to say, Brian. <laughs> Why would you say that? Um, so, yeah, we, we have this back and forth between maybe a bit more rational concepts and, uh, you know, the fear or whatever you're afraid of is a bit further away. And then just this overwhelming, overpowering, you know, suffocating, bringing in this fear, this tension, just bringing it to a head, bringing it right up to the top. You can't get any more out of it. And it overrides everything else in the song. You notice that there's no spoken word part during those sections. There is no part of the human body that is willing to think rationally. You're entirely working on gut instincts, fight or flight. Uh, your brain's racing. You got adrenaline surgeon surging through your body. That is kind of what I'm getting here. And then, of course, we have the picture of... The bandmates, I assume, in Water, the song is called Good Morning, Captain. There was a lyric? I don't know. Maybe I misremembered. I was going to say that there's a, a lyric alluding to being on a boat, but I'm kind of second-guessing myself on that, so I'm not going to definitively say that. But for whatever reason, between all of this imagery and words and the name of the song... My brain went to like a sinking ship and uh, just having all of these, you know, the, the constant fear of drowning. And maybe at some point you feel a little safer. Maybe you've made it to the top of the ship or whatever. Maybe it seems like the ship's not going to tip. Uh, you know, maybe they found a way to, to patch up whatever was causing the intake of water. And it's, it's this back and forth, like I said, between the tension of the possibility and then the actual action. The palpable feel, fear is gone and there is a very rational fear, tension, uh, you know, this is actually happening. That is the big explosive sections that would be when the ship would actually be sinking. And it's not something you can actively fight. And I think that's another... Uh, aspect of the song that is portrayed very strongly in those larger more bombastic sections is that you can't fight the fear it's going to crop up the tension is there you can't ignore it you can't run from it you can't defeat it you just have to exist within it and the song does a really good job of, of sort of creating that atmosphere through not only the volume but the width and then of course the extended dissonance through the uh the overdriven sounds of the guitar i also mentioned in the middle that the lower parts during the spoken word i could more easily push them into the background though those moments of dissonance were a bit lower and the spoken word was going on so there's something i could really focus in on and the overall section is just quieter, and I can kind of push that down a little bit more into the background. But once a lead guitar takes it up an octave or two, and then starts putting the dissonance in there, or when we get the overdriven guitar doing it, it is not something I can ignore. It's no longer something I can easily push to the background, or forget about, or focus on something else. It is right there, in my face. The tension is ever-present. 
And I think that's another really cool thing, although I might be reading a bit into that. That's just my personal experience. Some people might not be able to push the, that bass part into the background, and some people might be able to listen to the whole thing and just kind of ignore the dissonant sections altogether. But personally, for me, those, those louder guitar sections are a lot more difficult for me to ignore. And I don't think that it's any coincidence that they come at the sections that are more bombastic, they're louder, the spoken voice is gone, the spoken word is gone. It's the section of the song that I attribute to the fear being present, the tension being something that you cannot escape. Now, I have no idea what the lyrics are. The spoken word was extremely quiet. I had a hard time making it out. The mix was also a little dirty, uh, but I think it works. Usually I'm, I'm a fan, I, I promote cleaner mixes, but I, I do concede at times a dirty mix helps with atmosphere and right here it does 100%. But I had, uh, I had a hard time making out the, the lyrics. The only thing I really got at the end was when he was screaming that, uh, that he missed you, whoever you is. And uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like the final... The final, not hurrah, the final attempt at, you know, breaking out of whatever this is that is oppressing this, this person, whether it's the singer or the character in the song, um, to break free of whatever is overwhelming them or drowning them or suffocating them. Uh, they are screaming now. It is, it is no longer just the spoken word. So, yeah, like I said, this song does a fantastic job at creating these elements. It builds tension, it resides within the tension, it has ideas of a quasi-safetiness where the tension is more pushed into the background. Uh, I could personally start to ignore it on the second or third go around when you hit that section, um, but there are moments in the song where the tension or the fear or whatever is very in your face and not something you can ignore and it does all of this through timbre and dissonance now i mentioned that the dissonance is not um it's not key based right so it's not like somebody's playing an f sharp and someone else is playing an F, and they're clashing because they're a half step apart. To me, it's more exaggerated, and that tends to be a tonality thing. So it could be that they're both playing Fs, but that one instrument is tuned a bit sharper, one is tuned a bit flatter, and that is going to create a more harsher dissonance because the notes are even closer apart and just far enough apart that their wavelengths do not line up as well and our human ears do not hear them as much uh, as being the same note. So uh, it's, it's a very intentional decision. Um, to me, <laughs> with my, my history of working and playing music and writing music, focusing on consonants, to me it sounds like a band who did not tune their instruments before playing. And I said that about another show recently as well, when we checked out uh, the latest Sub Rosa song. It was a live performance. I don't remember what the song was called. Um, and they played around with this as well. And I made the same exact thing. And I, I don't think that that's a bias that I am going to be able to get rid of. <laughs> I can overcome it when I'm thinking about it, uh, you know, I, I've went through this whole analysis section without bringing it up. I don't want to make it the focal point. The dissonance is an intentional aesthetic design, and I don't think creating an illusion to an amateur mistake is the best way to speak about it. But I also do, do want to bring it up, uh, at least if anybody else finds themselves in this situation. It is the very first thing I think of when I hear this. <laughs> It sounds like a group all playing together and either didn't tune their instruments or did not tune them properly. Um, especially when you get with distorted instruments like this, the tuning needs to be very close because the overdrive and the distortion are going to amplify any dissonance. So you need to make sure that your instruments are tuned extremely well together. 
Um, but like I said, it is something that I overcome as I think about it. It's my gut reaction and then my brain immediately kicks in and says, yeah, that's what it sounds like. That's what your experience tells you. But remember, this was an artistic choice. Uh, so if anybody else finds themselves in that situation, you're not alone. <laughs> uh, I do have a gut reaction to think that it sounds bad. And casually, I will probably not listen to this. But I think there's also worth in looking at it from an artistic point of view and trying to see how it might work together and why it might be an intentional decision. For all I know, <laughs> it really was an amateur mistake and they just rolled with it. They said they liked it better and it worked as a textural thing. Um, or they might have just recorded it this way and didn't care. I don't know. <laughs> but I approach it as if it's an intentional decision because most people will not put out art with their name on it that they do not approve of. I certainly would never put out a song that sounded like this if my aim was consonants. So you just have to keep that in mind if anybody's in that boat with me uh, about being raised on consonants and and uh, you know as we explore music that that explores dissonance and you know works outside of what we typically consider to be beautiful music uh, once we get into post music and uh, you know 20th century classical and avant-garde and stuff like that um, it, it's good to keep in mind that you're allowed to have your gut reactions as long as you don't let them control your you know your thoughts about a song all right, those are my thoughts on Good Morning Captain by Slint. This is where you guys come in, though. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know if you enjoyed this or not. Is this post-rock? Is this proto-post-rock? <laughs> like I said, I can see some elements of post-rock cropping up in here, but it also feels like a different, a slightly different branch. And I think if more bands followed this, that this could have been called post-rock if it isn't. I don't know. When you're done commenting, you can head up to the description box. There's a link in there for Linktree, which is a really nifty place. It is a website that houses all of my links in a nice menu with buttons and icons, and it's a lot better than just randomly thrown together lengthy URLs. If you want to submit your own special selection, if you want to join the Discord community, support us through Patreon, follow me on Twitter, yada, 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 all those links are in there. I'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. We'll be continuing on with the short songs theme. And until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, though. Never cynical. Don't be cynical about art. About the music you consume, about any art, all of it. Just, you know, be critical about it. And have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening. Whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.